if you're like overly confident or whatever, and you're just kind of puffing and not everything's cool and all this, dude, nobody can help coach you. You need to be coachable, but to be coachable, you also need to be vulnerable. And that was a big breakaway with me because I would come in and say, this is right where I'm stuck. Can you help me? And they would work on that. I'd refine it, get through. And then I'd go back and be like, this is where I'm stuck now. I'm over here. And I would just continue to keep leveling up. All right, guys, welcome to another episode of the Report Saturday edition. I got my co-host today, my man, Dan Blackwell. Dan, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Rich. Appreciate you. Yeah, I appreciate you coming on, my man. And, uh, you know, Dan being a uh, experienced uh, seasoned vet in the multifamily broker space, specifically up in Orange County, a lot of value to provide, a lot of uh, what to do, but also what not to do, um, lessons learned over the years with humble beginnings. Um, but that said, Dan, man, let's dive into the top of this episode. Uh, how one can get started as a multifamily broker um, in this space, right? We're in 2024. We're in a high rate environment. We got an election year coming up. Um, I feel like this year right now is a, is a good time for a lot of people to get into something new, right? We saw a lot of, a lot of loan officers kind of wash out over the last two years. And you, I'm sure there's a lot of brokers that kind of washed out of the industry over the last two years. Same thing with the residential side and the realtor space. And so I think for someone starting right now, it's not the worst time to get in because there's probably a little bit less competition. That said, uh, what are your thoughts on, on the timing right now for someone brand new starting out? It's a great time because you want to learn when it's hard. You'll actually learn strong fundamentals. You'll get super strong at your metrics, your KPIs, your key performance indicators. You'll refine your skill set. If you get into a fast moving market, you might learn loosely and you think it's easy. -er, and then the market cycles down and then you get crushed and everybody leaves. If you learn in the bottom of the market or you know, where we're at now, hopefully we're starting to cycle back up. You might be able to get really, really disciplined in your skill set. And then when the market gets easier, you just can cons consistently stay disciplined. And that's where you can become a superstar. Yeah. If you need perfect conditions to start anything in life, whether it's a new business venture or a new hobby, if you need perfect conditions to start, like what's going to happen when the market does downturn, right? Um, so I agree with you there. So for someone that's, you know, interested in getting in the game, like how important is the market selection piece? It's, it's really important. I think uh, it's got to resonate with you. You know, I, uh, I remember being in the alley of an apartment row in Anaheim and I had a senior that took me on over 150 meetings and we were probably on meeting 10 or 12 and he goes, Dan, and I was photoing building and he goes, look up and I go, we're in some, you know, kind of not so good area. And he goes, this is the next 10 years of your life. Mm. And I'm like, Man, I, yeah. but you know, I wasn't selling like primo coastal property. I was still, I, I don't mind selling apartment buildings in Anaheim. I'm about to close my hundredth actually. Nice. Congrats, dude. Property just in Anaheim. Congrats. Yeah. It took a career, but um, it's really important because it's got to resonate with you. You don't want to get into because there's an opportunity. The people that was like, how are you super successful? They're like, I wanted to do this. It wasn't like, well, I got lucky and this person was hiring and now I sell timeshares. It's like, no, I wanted to, you thought it through. Right. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta love what you sell. Okay. That makes sense. So would you say like if someone's in, let's just say they're in some random market that's has, you know, multifamily fundamentals there, would you say, Hey, well, why don't you explore some ideal market and just move across the country? Or would you say, start where you're, you're familiar? I was getting my, I lived in North Carolina. I was getting my real estate license updated. And when you get your license updated, all you hear is single family home stuff. And I'm like selling land and whatnot. It wasn't applying. I was doodling on a pad in the back and some, I go, I've never even sold a house. And the guy next to me is like, what did you do? And I, I, I go, well, I sell land. And I'm like, what do you do? He's like, I'm in commercial. And I got to know him and I was 25 at the time. And he, long story short, he's like, dude, you want to sell apartments? And I go, yes. And I, he goes, you're going to have to move out of this small town. You should level up. You're not married. You have no kids. Like this is your moment. You need to get into a bigger market than Wilmington, North Carolina. You needed to get into Raleigh, Charlotte, Atlanta, where you can specialize because if you don't, you're going to be selling the nail salon, leasing out this, selling this condo. You'll be taking whatever you get. Doing random stuff. You're yeah. never going to be able to scale and build yeah, and be a superstar. That's good advice, yeah. And then I said, well, if I'm going to have to reset, why don't I think bigger and why don't we go right. play with the big boys and girls in the West Coast? Yeah, okay. So so after doing it, now looking back, you suggest someone else in those same shoes to, to also take that same approach? I think so. Assuming you know, they're going to go all in. You have to go all in, but if you can find a niche within your local market, you stay. But I went out and... I couldn't find what I was looking for. If you can't find what you're looking for, you need to decide. And I knew if I didn't make the big move to move across country and start and play in a competitive environment and have an opportunity to make, you know, seven figures, 
I would always wonder what it would have been like. I already knew what my life would look like in my small town. Nothing wrong with a small town. Love going back. But if you're really committed to getting into the business, you got to get into something that you can specialize in. So you find the right market and then uh, you got you to gotta pick a brokerage. There's a lot of commercial estate brokerages out there. How do you pick the right one? I think, you know, the biggest thing is like in a busy market, another reason why it's not good to go into a busy market because like the people you're going to work with are probably super busy. They don't have time to talk to you as much. Yeah. In the down market, transactions are slower. They got more time to maybe spend, mm, you know, you can do some ride alongs. You can get a little time. Better mentorship. A little bit. Exactly. Yeah. So you'll know it in your gut. I knew it in my gut. I met people. I knew it. This person is, I, you could just feel it. And I said, I'm going to, I'm going to go, I'm going to make my choice, your instincts. And instinctually, if that person was at Keller Williams, or if that person was at, you know, CBRE, I would have probably went to go work with that person. So, because you can get great mentorship in any, any company and you get terrible mentorship in any company. So you kind of got to really know, and you can still, it's like, it's like dating, like, <laughs> Right. Yeah. You got to get to know. But so I think meet as many people as you can and refine who you think would be a great fit with you. And then even if they're not hiring, you try to got to figure out a way to get in there. W would you say go to like a bigger shop with a, a huge team or, or maybe start with a smaller, like more boutique team? I love the boutique side of things for a lot of reasons, but I think the big firms also carry a lot of value, especially when you're new. Mm, like an m, &M. Like an M&M, a CB, you know, I learned at M&M. I looked around, you know, we all are very uh, aspirational when we're super young. And we still are, but when you're young, you, it could be a little distorted. It's like, I want to make two million bucks a year or whatever it is. Well, how many apartment brokers are making two million bucks a year? Well, there might only be one or none. Well, how many brokers are making $500,000 a year? Well, there's like maybe 12 to 15 of those. So it's like, the uh, am I? and then I, you ask yourself, am I making that kind of money right now? Well, no. Well then, hey, look, the odds are, if you come in here and work hard, you're probably going to make around 500 grand. You know what I'm saying? So you want to surround yourself with people. And then that's a great level up opportunity. You can go in, bring in some deals. Hopefully they help close them for you. You guys win together and uh, you level up. And then you can spin off and do a brokerage if you want. If you love real estate investing, passive income, and tax benefits, but don't have the time, my company, Summers Capital, is buying boutique hotels right now. We source the deals, we renovate the properties, and we even handle all the day-to-day -day management, making it truly hands-off for our investors. If you want to learn more to see if we can help you, visit summerscapital.com slash invest to book a call with our team. Again, that's summerscapital.com slash invest. Now back to the show. So what is the quickest way? Let's say someone gets in, they get involved with the brokerage, they're brand new, super green. What is the best path for them to make their first $500,000? Well, you don't want to get the kiss of death where you sell your first deal and you make a hundred grand and then you think it's always like that and then it's downhill and you quit. But uh, I've seen that a couple of times, but usually you want it to be difficult because that's the reality. I, I know it sounds weird to say, but that's the truth. Um, but it's like you're getting your master's in sales. You know, I didn't go to master and get my MBA. I got my master's in transactions, right? And helping clients and sales. So it took, it took a couple of years. It takes a couple of years, but if you stick with it, I think you could probably get there depending maybe like three, four years. Okay. That's pretty quick. Took me a little longer than that. I think it was like four or five. Yeah. And then once you get to that first 500, is it, what needs to happen to get from 500? Let's say you're doing 2 million a year. You really have to start buying back your time. And what I mean by that is, you know, you need to have an assistant. If you don't have an assistant, you are one and that's okay. But like, maybe you're not that great. Maybe Rich isn't that great at doing X, Y, and Z. Maybe Dan isn't doing great at X, Y, and Z, but there's other people that's their unique ability and they love that. So you want to find and arbitrage your time to where if you can go make, if Dan can go make a thousand bucks an hour negotiating transactions and helping clients, then I can pay somebody X to then go and handle some other things for me. And then I lift my time to where I spend more time in the productive quadrant. Yeah. And, and what kind of things are you delegating to the assistant in this, in this example? Well, I think you need to do a time audit and look at, you know, what needs to get done in your business, all the steps in your business. And then is there some things that you're not that great in that you're not efficient in? Like there's things I'm wildly inefficient in on the admin side. So it's like ridiculous. For, I'm like the worst person to do that, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like, I should not be doing that. But then also I'm not adding value to the team. So, because if I'm not on the phone, I'm not adding value. To yeah, the team. totally. So it's a, it's a, it's a total win-win, but you need to do a time audit. You need to look at all the tasks that you do, what's really sucking your time. But at, in the beginning, 
until you're making good money, we're talking about from 500 to 2 million, but you know, in the beginning you got to do it all and then you need to hire an assistant and then you need to get some of your time back and then you need to hire another one that can help you on certain aspects and then you need to hire another one and build out your team and that is a great path for them too and they can make a tremendous amount of money. You need to pay people well, you need to overpay. Mm. Overwork and overpay. Yeah. Whoops. No, I'm, I'm with I'm with you there, dude. Like I freaking I delegate a lot of stuff, and I know like with my team, I'm like if the bottleneck's on me, it does not get done. It just doesn't, you know. And so I, I we I are the bottleneck. Oh yeah, I'm always the bottleneck, and I, I am by far like n- like the quality of like production that you will get out of me for like 90 percent of the stuff that goes on in the business is is going to be way below how other other team members can do it, right? And so I delegate everything: emails, my whole emails is delegated. DMs and Instagram is delegated, like literally um, everything I can think of. I try to delegate or anywhere I can like save a little bit of time. Even like um, for a while, my barber was coming in here every Friday, He'd come right in the office Friday, at 11 o'clock, get my hair cut ready for the weekend. It's like I didn't spend time uh, going across town and waiting in lines and all that sort of thing. It's like those little things that save you time, you can reallocate to a higher and better dollar uses. You know, I really didn't start making a lot of money. Uh, I mean, relatively speaking, I didn't see a big jump in my goals of income until I started having kids because then your time, you don't have, you can't just work until you're totally like just wiped out and then you come home. You got to come home with some gas in the tank. You got to be there. So that made, that taught me about compressing time and getting a lot of things done. Uh, right now, some of our team, we have a full-time marketing person. We have a full-time EA, executive assistant for me, that's managing emails, my calendar, setting meetings, setting up all, all sorts of tasks, keeping me on priority. We have a full-time transaction manager that manages all the transactions. So we have about 20 buildings in escrow right now, all with critical dates. There's inspections, appraisals, offers coming in. We have another 15 buildings on the market. We've got two or three agents that have been with me for about eight years and two or three more that have been with us for about four or five years. And all those are now turning into partners where I'm bringing them in opportunities and they're bringing into me and we're all dividing and conquering. So it's not just Dan, you know, so they're leveled up, I'm leveling up with them and we're all doing it together. So, uh, and they're happy because I want to make sure it's, it's like not the right people on the bus, but it's the right people on the bus in the right seats. Mm, I love that. What's one, uh, what's one item, if you had to pinpoint one thing that separates uh, someone who gets into the, the multifamily commercial brokerage game and becomes successful and turns into, uh, it turns into a million dollar a year thing versus all these other folks that do it for six months, do it for nine months, and they wash out? You're always going to have a high level of wash out with the business because you really don't know what it's like until you get in the phone and you, you start doing it because you, you, you think you, there's really not a lot of transparency as what's it really like a day in the life, you know? Mm. We should do a video of that. Oh, I like that. But uh, I think one of the biggest things when I went and became more vulnerable with my mentor mm. and it's telling him where I'm stuck, right? I'm not closing appointments or I just can't figure this part of the business out, the whole continuum. There's so much to do. And once I started to get more vulnerable, that then that my mentor could then help me in those areas. It's like, think about it like when we go to the doctor. They're like, okay, Rich, what's wrong? Well, it hurts. My elbow hurts right here. Okay, well, tell me about it. Well, it hurts when I do this. It's like, okay, they're diagnosing. So it's the same thing. So if you don't, if you're like overly confident or whatever, and you're just kind of puffing and not everything's cool and all this, dude, nobody can help coach you. You need to be coachable, but to be coachable, you also need to be vulnerable. And that was a big breakaway with me because I would come in and say, this is right where I'm stuck. Can you help me? And they would work on that. I'd refine it, get through. And then I'd go back and be like, this is where I'm stuck now. I'm over here. And I would just continue to keep leveling up. That's so good. So be vulnerable. um, Be persistent. Know that it's not going to be easy. Know it's not going to be, you might go a long time without money. But uh, Dude, be yourself, man. I uh, always did that. I stayed true to myself. Sorry to cut you off, but that was one really important thing where it's like I would meet people and I'm like, sometimes it doesn't make sense to sell. And it's like, just tell them. Why? Don't sell it. Just wait. Yeah. You know? I love it. I love it. And I think the other takeaway of this episode is this is actually a great time to get in from a uh, timing of the market standpoint. A lot of these uh, brokers are washed out. And uh, like you said, a lot of the mentors right now in the space um, have a little bit more free time to um, provide some more guidance. I like that. I also like putting money, invest in yourself. We've all heard that. Like, hey, if you had 10 grand or you had 20 grand, what would you do? I'd invest myself. I'd read books. I mean, it's true though. Like I would listen to Brian Tracy goals. I'd write things down on a notepad before going to bed to get the, you know, uh, just get it in your subconscious, 
right? The goal setting, surrounding yourself with like-minded people. But I mean, I'm still doing that today. I'm still coaching with the highest level people that I can get them to give me their time. Yes. It's all about getting the right rooms and, uh, you know, shortcutting your path from point A to point B, investing in yourself, whether it's clothing, appearance. I mean, first impressions, everything, you know, and if you look good, you feel good. Um, also like, you know, working out, exercising, being fit, like all those things build confidence and uh, with confidence comes competency. And that's half the battle. I mean, half the battle is in the mind, you know, 90%. Like what we do is easy and, you know, the practice of it. But if you're mentally screwed up then, and I've been there, I've been down in the dumps for a long time. And you're right. If I would just work till I was burning out and I'm like, I'll just sprint the marathon, you know? Like, I don't care what my kneecaps blow out, my hips are, I'm going to sprint this marathon. I'm going to work as hard as I can, 24, seven, hundred hours a week. I don't care. But then you're, you're, you're not, you're not effective. Right? Yeah, so there it is. I should, I should have had you as a workout partner back in the day. Dude. Get <laughs> yeah, my ass I love the gym. that. <laughs> so I think this concludes this episode of the Saturday edition. Um, how can someone, if someone wants to come maybe join your team, how can they get in touch with you? Well, we're not hiring right now. Oh. But there's a lot of people that do reach out. I'm not able to spend time with everybody uh, respectfully, but um, shoot me a note if you want. I'll do what I can to respond back to you. You can reach us at multifamilysocal.com. I really want to make sure that I commit to the people that I've already committed to on the team and make sure they're successful. So that's where I'm at. And check them out on Instagram at multifamilysocal. We got to get you an online community, man. That's what I'm thinking next. But uh, I do have a big heart to help people because I know what it's like struggling and trying to find that start. Totally. Maybe that's the next move, man. We'll, we'll talk about it. He's Dan Blackwell. I'm Rich Summers. Listeners, thanks for tuning in. We'll see you in the next one. Peace.